right, good evening everyone and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, a member of the club's Board of Governors, the chair of the Zetima Project, and of course your moderator for tonight. The comedy news quiz, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, is the most popular show on public radio, with nearly six million viewers. We have a lot of those listeners out here tonight, which is great. It wasn't always this way. Uh, it was the program that didn't take off until Doug Berman, who also had produced the hit NPR show, Car Talk. <laughs> Doug took a chance on an, a little-known playwright named Peter Sagal to serve as host. And ever since, the show has drawn enthusiastic audiences, both on the radio and at its home in Chicago, as well as on the road. Two days ago, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me taped its 1,000th show. How about that? So what is the secret to the program's success? These two guests tonight are going to help tell us the answer to that question. I have Peter Sagal, the host of Wait, Wait, since 1998. He is a self-declared giant nerd and also an award-winning playwright, screenwriter, and author, most recently of the book, The Incomplete Book of Running, now out in paperback. He has interviewed two U.S. presidents, appeared on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, run a, waste, uh, sorry, run a race in his underwear. But he insists that none of this has gone to his head. And you can be the judge of that. The Peabody award-winning producer Doug Berman is responsible for NPR's two most successful entertainment programs. He continues to create comedy shows seated with a modicum of useful information, or as he puts it, not a complete waste of time. <laughs> Let's give a warm welcome to Peter Sagal and Doug Burke. Before, before we get started, I, I'm genuinely curious about this. Um, obviously, I'm Peter Sagal, and I was just wondering, you presumably knew what neither of us looked like. Who assumed, as we walked on stage, <laughs> The, the guy who is in, you know, like, fronts the show and is the star in the radio was the good-looking one. <laughs> <laughs> Serious? Anybody like? Well, that's obviously because that. Really? All right. Yeah. I'm just wondering. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get started with how the show got started. So, Doug Berman's producing the hit show Car Talk. It's already won a Peabody Award. It's 1997. NPR comes to you and says, "We want to, you to do another show." How did you come up with the concept, or did you come up with the concept? How did and how did wait wait to get started? Yeah, I, I came up with the concept, but I you know I I, I I I think it's important to understand that you know coming up with a concept, coming up with an idea is you know literally about five percent of the way to having something you know, and it was really the work that the staff we ended up putting together you know over time, uh, including Peter, you know, really did in in creating this thing. So I'm sometimes credited with creating it, but I just sort of started the ball rolling down the hill, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, when, what I had in mind um, is when I, was, when I was a kid, I grew up in New York, and there was a dead zone on late night television at 11 o'clock before Johnny Carson came on, and there was a, one of the local stations ran re, reruns of You Bet Your Life, Groucho Marx's show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I think somewhere in the back of my head I had that, that sort of... Uh, planted there. And I wanted to do something that was related to the news because I knew all the people that were listening were listening and, and absorbing the news all week. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could have fun with that? And that's, that's where it started. That's where it started, too. Mm -hmm. So you got started in January of 1998? Well, that's when the show first the started. Show first so launched, we started so working on it. Uh, you know, we did several iterations starting about sometime in 95. Wow. So wow. it you know, had a gestation period and then and then a difficult birth. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. It's very interesting. So, you, you, you know, the first real show was January of 98. Yeah. Um, you had a host then. Uh, didn't really work out. And by May, you asked Peter, to be, who had been a panelist. Yeah, it may have been April, I think. But no, actually, you asked me in early February. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It, <laughs> okay. it, it had a rough start. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't I mean, it's like, it's like when you launch a ship and it's immediately on fire. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. And Peter, this would require you to move from New Jersey to Chicago. Yeah, well, technically New York at that time. Oh, New York, Chicago. So were you surprised? Why do you think Doug asked you? And by the way, what did you say when he first asked you? To this day, I have no that's idea. That's No, I, I mean, uh, I, what... I guess I should fill it in. So I, so Doug, radio professional, was busy creating the show. 
I was trying to make a living as a playwright and screenwriter and doing okay. Uh, you may have heard of my magnum opus, Dirty Dancing 2, Havana Nights. <laughs> take, take a bow. I, I, no, 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 no. I, I, we can entertain questions about that later in the program. <laughs> so I was doing that and um, I got a call from uh, a friend of mine who said, I know these people at NPR who are putting together a show, they're looking for funny people who read a lot of newspapers, and I thought of you. And would you, would you like to be part of this thing? And I was like, yes, of course. I mean, I was an NPR junkie and, and uh, would love to be on it. So my name was put in, and I got a call from uh, the original senior producer of the show, a guy named David Green, um, ask, and I auditioned and got to be a panelist on the show and was a panelist on the very first show in January of 1998. Uh, with a different host, and it was, like I said, about a month later in early February when I get a call again from David Green saying, saying so the host isn't working, how would you like to give it a try? Mm -hmm. And um, here we are 21 years later. Did, did, what was your initial reaction? I was, I was very, uh, I was sort of surprised, uh, I was excited. Um, I, I, it seemed, cr it seemed desperate to me, <laughs> frankly. It was. <laughs> I mean, I've, I, I, I mean, I've, I've always referred to it as a battlefield promotion, you know, and, and I was telling that to the reception upstairs and somebody said, so it's like the general got killed and all of a sudden you get promoted. And I said, it's more like the general was shot by his own troops and now <laughs> promoted. Uh, I mean... I literally had no idea how to do anything related to this job. I had never done anything like it. In fact, after doing it for a while, they decided to hire me permanently. I had to apply to the, I basically had to apply through the formal process to NPR to be considered for the job that I was doing. And I had to fill out this application, and they said, what is your experience in radio? With like an enormous like, space to write in. <laughs> and all I could write was like, well, I've been hosting Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me for three months. That's it. Uh, so, <laughs> but I, I have both a curse and, I guess, ultimately a blessing, which is I have this weird belief that I could do anything. Uh, and that his with one exception, I've always been wrong. And Peter, what, what was the exception? <laughs> oh, yeah, car, you. Now, you have to, you have to, did you have to give up your screenwriting and playwriting? I, I, I didn't think I was going to, but I did. Uh, I just assumed to my, does anybody here like write for a living? Um, <laughs> If, if you do, you're probably aware of the fact that if you do write for a living, which I was doing, you don't really write all day because you really can't. You can maybe write, if you're doing creative writing, maybe three or four hours a day, maybe five or six if you're really, really disciplined. So I just assumed I would like go out and do this radio show part-time and then keep writing. But the way I used to think about it, I had also, by bizarre coincidence, the week after the show began, my first of, of ultimately three daughters was born. Mm -hmm. So while we were launching the show, I was also uh, starting a family. and. Uh, and the way I thought of it was I could have a job, a family, like you think of a triangle, job, family, writing career, and I could have any two. <laughs> uh, so I ended up with a job, i.e. the radio show, and my, uh, my family, and there we are. Yeah. Well, I'm interested in how you guys work together. So Doug, we introduced you as producer, but my understanding is your real title is Benevolent Overlord. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. So first of all, Peter, can you comment on the, benev the benevolent part of that? Is that lies, lies. lies. <laughs> so I'm curious, like how you make decisions uh, together as a team with other people on the staff and so forth. How, yeah. does, how does that work? First of all, benevolent over overlord is my formal NPR title. I'm the only one in NPR with that title. <laughs> it's in my contract. Um, we uh, we're fortunate that we have a, a team of people. Was it six or so people in the yeah, it, it, it varies, but it's about, generally about six other than myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'd say every one of them is funnier than I am, fortunately. And um, we, you know, what we do is we discuss stuff. We discuss the material. 
Um, we try to figure out what's funny about any given news story. We try to figure out which stories are appropriate, which are completely inappropriate, and then which the one, ones are not going to do. Um, and um, the way it, it works is, is that people in the meeting represent different opinions and different ideas and different expertise. And that sort of give and take and, and tug and pull is what, is what results in you know, this, these great decisions most weeks. You know, and it really, it works like 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. And do the guests themselves, are they involved in any of those? No. 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 They're not we, staff. The, 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 the panelists? Yeah, yeah, the panelists. No, yeah. they, we just push them out. And yeah. <laughs> they, they just do their thing. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The show is produced and written by m my colleagues in Chicago in our home office with Doug kind of benevolently overseeing. <laughs> and uh, overlording, mm -hmm. and, uh, but we prepare the material, we write the questions, we try stuff out, we throw it out, we improve it. But the panelists have n almost no idea what we're gonna do. Some things they can guess, well obviously they're gonna talk about the big, uh, big items in the news, and they prepare the fake stories, what we call Bluff the Listener. Mm -hmm. But we found out a while ago that, and, and I've been saying this for a while, I'm actually interested if, if you agree with this, because I've been saying it for a long time, um, I'll take a guess and say I don't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that would, that would, but go ahead and see what it is. That would, that would be typical. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> my joke is that whichever of us dies first. This is your joke. This is my joke. Whichever is dies first, the other one will be standing over the grave going, fine, I got the last word. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, completely lost. So what we found, what I think is, you know, there are a lot of people who do what we do, who make fun of the week's news. And I know some of them, and they're incredibly smart, and they have, like, this incredible amount of firepower mm -hmm. to bring to the problem. Like, Stephen Colbert must have 15 writers. Mm -hmm. I think John Stewart had literally 30 writers. Uh, and what they do is incredibly polished, brilliant writing that they practice and polish and put in visual elements, and so it's just a great produced bit of comedy. And we don't have the resources to do that. But more to the point, that's not exactly what we do. What we do is basically improv. Mm -hmm. Because the thrill of, and the fun of our show is that it sounds live. Because it is live, at least it was live to tape, in that, that we don't know what the panelists are going to say. They don't know what we're going to ask them. And so what you're hearing when it sounds like somebody is coming up with something off the top of their head, they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that is how we stand out in this crowded, I think what they say here in the, in the Bay Area, space. <laughs> <laughs> so so mo most of it's, a lot of it's written and then it's improvised uh, uh, over the list. We, we sort of, basically the way I put it is we spend all week preparing to be unprepared, preparing to be spontaneous. So I'll have in front of me when we do our show, I'll have a script that we've all written and collaborated on and polished and redone. But, you know, I'll, I'll, it's a little bit like, have you ever like listened to Supreme Court arguments? Like a, a lawyer will prepare and prepare and prepare and prepare and practice with his colleagues or her colleagues and they'll get ready to make their argument to the Supreme Court and they get four sentences in and the next thing you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg saying, well, that sounds ridiculous. And you know, all of a sudden have to, like, go with it. That's basically my experience. We do all this preparation, and instead of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it's Paula Poundstone. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned long ago that the only thing you can do is just jump on her boat and go where she's going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, very back. well, you mentioned Bluff the Listener, which is actually my favorite, my favorite individual part of, of the show. And for those of you who don't know, Bluff the Listener is when they pick a theme, and each of the three panelists uh, reads a story that's based on that theme. Uh, and uh, only one of the three stories is true. And they all seem highly improbable, right, <laughs> right from the start. And uh, the contestant has to guess which story is true to win the prize. Um, I love this part, but I'm terrible at it. And I, I, when I try to guess it, I get, you know, I get less than random chance, I'm sure, overall. I don't know what that says about me that I'm unable to guess implausible stories or believe them, but I'd never win the prize. But I'm curious, do, do you write those? Do the panelists write them? Where do those stories come from? Well, first, the staff picks the real story. We always start there. Mm. And um, we always look for a story that we call, that we label as NFW, mm. which stands for no way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and once, once we have that story, then what we'll do is we'll try to 
come up with a theme. And again, this is done, you know, in this meeting and with this group. We'll try to come up with a theme that, that sort of includes that story, but gives the two other panelists a chance to do a creative writing exercise and come up with a story that fits that theme uh, and, and produces this set altogether of three stories that can, you know, feasibly be described under this theme. Yeah. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll give, we'll assign the real one to somebody and we'll usually discuss that. Who's, who do we think can, will best, uh, you know, handle the real one and more often who will best handle the, the bluffs. And then the, um, the panelists are responsible for writing their own stories and we edit them and we help them polish them and then they, they come up with it. That's the panelists, so. Yeah. I was thinking you hired people, yeah. whoever, Whoever applies for the job and lies on their resume, they're the best people to, <laughs> to take it because those are, those, are, those are great. And you've had a lot of terrific um, panelists on the show and along the way. But I wanted to ask you, what about the duds? Who was who the worst panelist you've ever had? Uh, Why don't we talk about the worst guest? Yeah, yeah. Agree on that's that. easy. Yeah. Yeah. I, will say, I will tell you one story is uh, many years ago, it must have been in the early 2000s mm -hmm. because we're in Chicago, we were working with Second City to look for talent. And we had this guy come in and he was very successful at Second City. He was very funny. He was you know, already a sort of acclaimed there. And he came in and we put him in the panel for like two shows and he just didn't have it, you know? And which is no fault of his. Our show is really hard to do. You have yep. to be spontaneous, but you have to. It's a weird, it's a weird yeah, skill set. Very talented people have yeah. come to our show and not succeeded because it's just so odd. And that guy, so we sort of said, oh, thanks, it didn't work out. And I don't remember what happened to him. His name was Keegan Michael Key. Never <laughs> know. <laughs> this is, of course, the judgment of talent that arrived at me, so I think um, uh, But it we, we've, we, generally speaking, I, I, I think we agree on this. We're at the point where we know what we're doing on our current panelists are so good that we can take a flyer on somebody. Mm -hmm. We can bring somebody in and like what we think of as the third chair. And sometimes they'll be great. Like recently, like last year, we invited in this woman named Maeve Higgins, mm -hmm. who we instantly all fell in love with. She was amazing, her voice is brilliant. One of the things um, that I have learned from Doug and had to learn, it was a little difficult, is that far more than the content of what you say, how clever you are, uh, how inventive your humor is, whatever. In radio, it's far more important how you sound. And that's not necessarily the timbre of your voice or your accent, although those contribute. But it's, do you sound like somebody people might like? Do you sound pleasant and likable and somebody they want to spend their time with? Which ultimately was the secret of car talk, I think. I don't think you'd disagree that Tom and Ray were just delightful people that people wanted to spend an hour with. It didn't matter what they were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, and, and I can't tell you, I mean, I'm sure many of you agree that people listen to Car Talk religiously and didn't care or know anything about cars. That's not why they were listening to them. Neither did Tom and Ray. Right. <laughs> uh, there you are. And so, and so the people who really work well on our show, and Maeve's a good example because she's recent and we all so agreed about it. Uh, there are people who, in addition to being funny and charming and quick and improvisational and original and know stuff we don't know, but they just sound like people you want to hang out with. And they're authentic. Yeah, and yeah. which is part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Doug, you sound like you had an idea about a guest you weren't, uh, which <laughs> guest you didn't like so much. Well, I, I, I'm pretty sure Peter will agree with me. Because these guests mostly come, you know, they call in. Or yeah, we have not my job, call. yes, yeah. and we, we bring them on, and, and the, you know, the idea of the segment is, is that uh, somebody comes on and then answers three questions about something they know nothing about. You know, and the idea is you get to know somebody in a little different context than you would during a normal interview on, say, All Things Considered or on Colbert or whatever like that. Um, and there was one guest we had one time, and I think you probably know him. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know? he instantly Ooh. took the crown. He, he, he was within a minute. We all hated the guy. <laughs> we were like, "Oh no, wait a minute! I'm sorry. You're being uh, you're being kind. His name is Gene Simmons." <laughs> And in fact, he was so awful and obnoxious that I swore at that time, and this was 2002, that I would tell everybody who asked, who's your worst guest? Gene Simmons. That's S-I-M-M. -M. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was so awful that um, one, of the, one of the panelists, Roy Blunt Jr., 
<laughs> confessed afterwards that he was he almost just said let's stop this let's let's cut this interview off let's <laughs> cut he wanted to stop in the middle of the interview and just stop doing it what was so bad about well, it well uh, he was just he was obnoxious in a way that was um, really unpleasant you know, he was he was as, as he opposed was, to the pleasant obnoxiousness. He was, he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's a certain pleasant on obnoxiousness. You owe me for that one. Okay. I basically put I, it in a little tea. You were just so, sitting there. No, I was. Um, I take it back. No, um, <laughs> he 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 made fun of the way Peter spoke, and he made fun of people's names, and he. What else did he do? He was just... All right. He was disgusting. So, yeah. Yeah. I call and speak to all of our guests prior to interviewing them in the air. I want to get to know them. I want to make sure they know what they're getting into. Sometimes they think they're going on, like, real NPR, and I need to dissuade them. <laughs> <laughs> this story will involve an ethnic slur. Mm. So, I'm talking to him, and I say to him, because he had just come out with a book, and what's interesting about Gene Simmons is that he was raised as an Orthodox Jew who went to yeshiva, and he left yeshiva to like pursue rock and roll because he thought that would be more fun. He was correct in this. <laughs> and we all thought... Otherwise, it's the story of the failure of religious education. Right. <laughs> and not just us, but a lot of people assumed that this was a great story. This is a, this is a story about entertainment and a guy putting on a show and a guy who would be, we assumed knowingly ironic about his career in the way that, for example, um, I'm blanking on his name, Alice, uh, Alice Cooper is. We interviewed Alice Cooper and he's exactly that. He says, yeah, I was like putting on a vaudeville show for the kids. It was great. Um, so I'm talking to Gene Simmons on the phone and I say, you know, I wish I had known you were Jewish because I didn't have any really cool Jewish role models growing up. We just had like Woody Allen and he's like, well, how about Moses? <laughs> How about Jesus? Those are role, role models, which is not a wonderfully charming thing to say, but it's a thing to say. Mm -hmm. So now we're doing the interview, and he has, like, he has come to offend. He is just everything he is saying to us is more offensive and misogynistic and awful. He's the original troll, baby. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, which I think is his brand. Yeah. And so I'm desperate because I'm sitting at this point, we're in the control room, we're not doing it live in front of an audience, and my producers are like pulling out their hair because this guy is awful, there's nothing we can broadcast. And all of a sudden I think of that exchange that I had had with him and I'm like, as lame as that was, it's better than this horror. <laughs> so I say, now we're taping for the radio show, I say, Gene, I wish I had known you were Jewish when I was growing up, I could have used a cooler role model. He said, yep, I'm a kike. <laughs> That's Gene Simmons. Wow. Love him. And so, what, 17 year, years later, I'm still mad about you it. You still remember. <laughs> but my vengeance but he, is he's, Gene Simmons. He sucks. He's, uh. he's the, uh, <laughs> he will always have the crown. I don't think anybody's ever going to top him for a worst No, no one will. Everybody else is a breeze compared to Gene Simmons. Yeah. Good. And even if they do, we're still going to say Gene Simmons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it. Did get that Gene Simmons part? Well, I want to make sure we, we, we we're, of course, we're talking about wait, wait, but we can't go through tonight without saying a few things about car talk. So, any car talk fans here, by the way? <laughs> it's like pretty much, pretty much everybody. So, uh, Doug, you've had the, the two biggest comedy hits on public radio. I, I know that you, That's damning with faint praise. Yeah, that's what you said. It's kind of like the policy of the seven dwarfs, right? Well, Doug has been uh, wise in choosing his competition. <laughs> yeah. But car talk and wait, wait, what do those two shows have in common, and, and why do you think they were both successful? Yeah, um, I, I mean, f for one thing, I, I think you mentioned this early on, that I, I think that you know, they both are not a complete waste of time, <laughs> you know, where um, they're essentially entertainment shows, but there's a modicum of information, and there's something you walk away with knowing that you didn't know before, mm -hmm. and you're a little happy about knowing it, or you're, you know, you're something you want, to, you want to tell somebody. So I think there's, they have that in common. I think they have they're they're they both feature very authentic, interesting people who you like to spend time with, uh, who have uh, you know an overall sort of positive view of humanity and of the world, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's you know those are the the key elements of what what they have in common, what makes them both successful. And Tom Ray Magliacci were such unusual people, right? They're MIT yeah. M engineers. Tom had a PhD. Uh, they were mechanics with all that stuff, yep. and uh, Tom didn't even like cars that much, did he? <laughs> 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 uh, 
he liked cars, but he thought they were a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, their message was, hey, it's only a car. Yeah. yeah. And how did they get on the radio? I mean, they, they were doing the show for 10 years, well, a little local a, program, right? Yeah, this is one of the great things about NPR. And this is, you know, Peter referred to this earlier. as like, you know, he didn't have any experience. Well, NPR has, has got a long history of, of taking people who have a lot of substance or a lot of something to offer mm -hmm. and putting them on the radio, even though they've never been on before. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a, it's a collection of, of unique, uh, and special people. Um, and those, you know, they were two of them, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they were, um, you know, just, they were, they were, uh, they had a, a garage business they were starting up and, um, one day the person who was doing this little, uh, you know, call in show, uh, called them over and said, Hey, I want to do a, a panel show on with mechanics. You guys interested? Mm -hmm. And Ray said, uh, "Hey Tom, are you busy? I don't want to do it. You go." Yeah. And he sent Tom over, and uh, there was supposed to be a panel of six. And uh, Tom got there that night, and there was a panel of one. And um, he took questions for half an hour, and it went really well. And he's, the guy said, "You want to come back sometime?" He said, "Yeah, can I bring my brother?" Yeah. And uh, so they came back, and they ended up with their own show, which for which they volunteered mm -hmm. in for a long time. And it was another wonderful case of benign neglect, you know, where, you know, for a number of years, nobody cared what they did. Nobody listened. Nobody corrected them. And nobody told them how to be on the radio and how to, you know, be a radio announcer. And so they never got that sort of, you know, um, you know, that, that whitewashing of make them sound like everyone else. They became completely comfortable being themselves. And, um, you know, that's what, what made the show really work. Yeah, yeah. And they really had great senses of humor in person, too, didn't they? I would say so. Yeah. yeah I mean, they're pretty much exactly what, like, what you heard on the air, yeah, off the air, you right? Peter, uh, yeah, I, I, I got to meet them. Uh, Tom, obviously, has, has passed away. Yeah. But I got to meet them. It was at a public radio convention around 2001. And I remember, like, and, and they, like, did not go to the public radio conventions. They, like, You had they, to drag them. Anything yeah. that wasn't fun, yeah. they weren't they interested. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that's how they lived their lives. They, yeah, they, I, I, believe, I, I believe, I don't know if you met the one in Orlando. I believe yeah. they came as a favor to Doug because the idea was they were saying, oh, you listen to Car Talk. Hey, station, put on this new show from yeah. Doug Berman. Wait, wait, don't tell me afterwards. So it was a cross-promotion. They were lending us their prestige. And I meet them, and, like, there they are. And I said something, and they laughed. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and the first thing I said to myself was, "Hey, man, I just made Tom and Ray Meliazzi laugh. <laughs> I'm pretty sharp." <laughs> and the second thing I said to myself was, "Like it's Tom and Ray Meliazzi. <laughs> they laugh at everything." <laughs> <laughs> but they really were. I mean, and that that in a weird way that was kind of a lesson to me because I, as, as I've already established, I had no idea what I was doing, and the fact that these guys were somehow able to project who they genuinely were on the radio, and of course it helped that they were genuinely delightful, uh, was like, oh, that's, that's how you have to do it. Because if you can't do that, if you, again, I'll, I'll repeat what I said earlier, if you can't be somebody that people want to spend their time with on a regular basis, it doesn't matter how smart or how funny or interesting you are, because people are going to be like, I don't like that guy. Or, yeah. And they, were, they, they did whatever they wanted, they were quite irreverent. Did that ever get them in trouble? Like, were sued or anything? Uh, <laughs> well, they got threatened with suits. We got, we got a number of threats. And the one that came closest, uh, one that was the most concerning, was uh, from a company called Chrysler. Maybe you heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the particular problem was that Chrysler uh, had just given a million dollars to NPR. <laughs> um, and, and not that long after that, uh, somebody called up. This must have been, I don't know when it must have been, maybe it's the very late 80s or early 90s or something. And, and Chrysler was making a, a minivan called a caravan. And it, it came with two engine options. One was a four-cylinder engine that I think was made in Indiana. And the other one was a six-cylinder engine, which they bought from Mitsubishi in Japan. And some guy calls the show and says, hey, I'm going to buy a Dodge Caravan. Which engine should I get? And Ray, you know, who always speaks what he thinks is the truth and who worked on both of those engines, said, uh, you should get the Mitsubishi engine. Said it's a, it's, a, it's a more reliable engine, it's more powerful, 
and uh, I think you'll be happier with it. And that would have been fine if they had left it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but then Tom, Tom says, you know, in fact, that's, that's the reason they, they invented the caravan, just made it a seven-passenger vehicle, because when you have the four-cylinder engine and you get to a hill, you need six people to get out and push. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we heard from Chrysler's lawyers the very next morning, <laughs> uh, and then NPR's lawyers the af in the afternoon, uh, and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a little tense for a week, but they... Uh, Ray refused to apologize for it, <laughs> and he refused to apologize for Tom. Um, and he said, that's really my opinion, and that's my opinion, and I'm sticking with it. And he, he did, and, um, <laughs> that was great. and the show, show went on for another 20 years. So, uh, but yeah, that was, that was the closest we've come. Well, just one little other piece. We promised a little backstory, and just one, little, one more thing on Wait, Wait, and that is I always found it amusing. You mentioned to me that you, know, you ran uh, their production company, which was called... Dewey Cheatham and Howe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you remember Car Talk, they had all kinds of funny names of things and people at the end, and yeah. all of us always thought that was a fake, uh, but that was the real name of their production company. Well, we, we, had, you know, we had to name our production company. We had to come up with something, and you know, Tom and Ray were fans of the Stooges um, when they were kids, and, and so we just thought, wouldn't it be fun to pick up the phone and say, Dewey Cheatham and Howe? <laughs> and um, so we, we, we named it that, and it... Um, you know, we, and we wanted a big gold leaf window over Harvard Square that said Dewey Cheatham and we got that. Um, and the only time it really caused us trouble was when we first got our office. Um, the very first thing they wanted was a couch, of course. Um, so I dutifully go over to Jordan Mosh in Boston and I, I order a couch and to be delivered the following week. And then the following week comes and the couch doesn't show up. And so I called up the next day, and I, you know, and they say, well, it got canceled. And, uh, um, you know, I said, why, why did it get canceled? Hang on, get me a supervisor. The supervisor gets on, and I say, can you, you know, tell me why my order was canceled? And the lady says, come on, do we cheat him and how? You think we're going to fall for that? <laughs> So I, I had to work standing for another week, but <laughs> we eventually got the couch. All right, let's see if you can fall from a couple, for a couple of audience questions. Uh, when will POTUS, when will Donald Trump be on Wait, Wait? <laughs> Did, have you guys ever talked about that? <laughs> I, I know what I think. I don't know what you think about it. So uh, what do you think about it? Well, I think it, it's going to come when, as soon as he figures out that there's something called NPR that exists. And, <laughs> which, or in other words, never. Right? <laughs> which what is true, by the way. Um, and he doesn't know NPR exists. He, that's literally true. And we know that because back in 2016, NPR was covering the candidates and the Republican and Democratic side, and they got to interview everybody except Donald Trump. And he just wouldn't come on the air, which bothered them. They're responsible news people. So they commissioned David Falkenflick, NPR's media reporter, to find out why. Mm -hmm. And he found out why, which is that Donald Trump doesn't care about anything that's not in his world. Mm -hmm. If it's like he listens to, you know, he watches cable news, and he listens to conservative talk radio, and if it's not one of those things, he just doesn't care. It's just like you can't convince him to do it. Well, uh, wears a short skirt. Right, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's another Soon? problem. I'm not his type. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so there's that. Like, he would, I mean, even if we were to ask, I mean, he won't come on All Things Considered. He's not going to come on our show. Peter tried to get him to, <laughs> to, get him to listen by you know, making worse and worse jokes about him week after week, figuring at some point <laughs> someone will tell, tell him, him, and he'll have to try to like, take the funding away, or at least they'll know we exist. No, nope. it didn't happen. <laughs> didn't work. But what, what I tell people is we've had, we've had two, we've, we've been in the air for four presidents, Clinton, uh, Bush, Obama, and now Trump. We've had two of those four, Clinton and Obama, and I'd love to get Bush. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I like to say to people is the reason we like to do our interviews, what we like to do in our interviews is we like to take well-known people, especially if they're political and they're known for their political opinions, and we like to show that they have a human side, right? That there's somebody to them other than the political statements or positions or things they've done, and that way maybe you can continue to hate that person for their political positions, but at least you'll understand that it is a person. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think 
there's any kind of person. <laughs> I, 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 I honestly... Well, I mean, I mean, whether or not you agree with that judgment of his quality, there's certainly nothing about him that he needs any help revealing. Let's just say that. <laughs> so I don't think, uh, if, if we did have a chance to interview him, I don't think it would be revelatory in any way. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, given that show is meant to be funny, both President Trump and a lot of the others in Washington, to be fair, make your job a bit easier these days, right? And you got some other funny things going on. I mean, when there's a story in the news about someone stealing a, a gold-plated toilet, you know, yeah. that was that was that was one of the. I, okay, it was meant for you. No, right? excuse me, not yeah. gold-plated, solid gold. Solid gold friend. toilet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. I, I worried when we were first starting the show. You know, will, would we have enough material? Yeah, <laughs> I really did. And, I mean, to give you a context, the, this was right before the whole Monica Lewinsky thing. You know, so I mean, if you want to split American history, you can almost go before that and after that when everything was ridiculous almost. Um, so we've we've had no problem since 1998. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the funny stuff. But what about when the news is bad? I'm sure there's a lot of topics that you can't. You know, you're not going to cover a school shooting with what you do overall too. I assume there's some things that are right on the borderline. And then, uh, so I guess I'd like to understand, like, wh what are some of the examples of where you've struggled of, uh, of where something, is this funny or not, or is this too edgy to cover? Um, so, yeah, obviously that's a problem, especially in a week. I mean, it's more of a problem than you think, because if something terrible happens in a given week, uh, a school shooting, a massacre, whatever, obviously we're not going to make jokes about that. But the, author, the another problem is, is that news story tends to drive out other coverage. Yeah. And we're always very dependent on actual journalists who are like reporting in this stuff, and so we can find it and make jokes about it. So it's a problem. Um, so we have some rules. We don't make fun of obvious tragedies. We don't make fun of people who are victims of any way, either of circumstance or of other people's actions. Um, and we actually see ourselves as sort of a balm, if you will, for a listening audience that sometimes, especially these days, is traumatized by the news. And we, we look at ourselves, I mean, sometimes when there's a very serious news event, you'll turn and see Jimmy Kimmel say, or Jimmy Fallon, and they'll start the show with a very, very serious statement. They'll say, hey, you know, this happened today, and it's really heartbreaking, and maybe they'll even get emotional about it, and that, I think, for them is good. We never do that, ever. I wanted to early on, I was dissuaded, uh, correctly, because that's not our show. Our show is not like a national gathering place. Our show is, hey everybody, this week it sucked, but tune in to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and we will be goofy about some of the stuff that sucked and we'll bring you all this other stuff that didn't suck that was kind of funny and charming. And uh, for me, I'm not sure if Doug uh, has the same feeling, for me, believe, well, the first show we did after 9-11 was a huge revelation because 9-11 happened and we honestly thought we'd be off the air and we literally were for a couple, a week or so. Uh, but I was like, how are you gonna make fun of the week's news when the week's news had just killed 3,000 people? Yeah. And we talked about, when we f did go back in the air more than a week later, we were like, well maybe we should just like ignore the week's news which was still filled with smoking wreckage and we'll just do like a theme show about funny news in history or funny news about science or whatever. And we said, no, we'll do the week's news. And so we did the week's news. We even made jokes that were related to 9-11. I remember one story was that we made a funny thing about, a, about how a, a, a mobster in jail called up the, like, I don't know whom, the U.S. government and said, hey, I got a backhoe you guys can borrow if you need it. He was trying to be patriotic. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you can... We made the jokes you're thinking. So, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and we did the show, we put it out in the world, and we got this huge response. We didn't have a lot of listeners back then, we, maybe in the hundreds of thousands. And we got hundreds of emails, more than we'd ever gotten, and almost all of them were like, oh, thank you. Thanks, because the news has been so awful, and people have been listening to it with such a sense of, like, duty. I have to listen to this. We're all enduring this, I think, on an ongoing basis now. And they just enjoyed the fact that we showed up at 10 a.m., 11 a.m. on Saturday morning and made fart noises and silly jokes and puns. Mm -hmm. And for an hour they could relax. Yeah, people said it was the first time I'd left in a week and a half, you know. Mm. And so that's, you know, that's, that's our job, you know. We have to give people a chance to, to escape yeah. and to laugh about things and remember that it's not so bad. 
And Peter, I'm, I'm curious as to whether, as how that worked for you when you had a, a, a personal tragedy. Um, you know, you write in your book, yeah. Peter's a marathon runner, and you see in his book that uh, during the Boston Marathon bombing, Peter had run that marathon yeah. and narrowly escaped, we're talking by seconds, by being at the finish line when the bombing happened. Yeah, that was How weird. was that for you when you did the next show? Uh, that was kind of, I don't, think, I don't think we mentioned it. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> I ran the 2013 Boston Marathon as a guide for a blind runner and we had just crossed the finish line when the bomb went off right behind us. That was interesting. Um, not what one expects. Uh, and, and, and I'm very... I need to be very careful about that topic because I, I, I can't even hint or allow anybody to think that I consider myself a victim of the Boston Marathon bombing. I'm fine. I wasn't traumatized. People were hurt and killed. That was not me. What is kind of interesting though and is related if you've read my book is my book also talks about a personal crisis that I was going through at the same time which was very, very difficult. My marriage was breaking up and it happened in the worst way. And it was very, very difficult. Um, without getting into details why. And there were days when I just felt miserable and yet I had to go and do this job in which I'm not allowed to be miserable. I have to be cheerful and fun and up because of you sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> that, you can get a laugh at some other people. That's pretty good. I am not your clown. Anyway. <laughs> And it was tough. In, in fact, things got so difficult that our boss at the time, or my boss, uh, a guy at NPR, actually offered me a time to you know, you, you know, take a leave of absence. But I couldn't because lawyers are expensive. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure none of you were lawyers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what I found, which is why I bring all this up here, is that I had to do the show. And I can't do the show if I'm miserable or depressed or thinking about the things that are making me miserable or depressed. I had to be cheerful. And what I found was like doing the show on a weekly basis because I had to actually help me get through what I was going through. Because I, I had to put it aside, all the stuff that I was worrying about, and do the show and be funny and be up and be charming and be happy to talk to people and be happy to be there. And it turns out if you force yourself to do those things, you eventually start believing them. And weirdly, we're sort of nationally in a time of trauma where a lot of us have an emotional reaction to the news that's almost as if you're personally being assaulted or offended or whatever, and it's emotional. And people come up to me all the time after the show, we always meet the audience, and they say, oh, wow, listening to your show gets me through the week, looking forward to it. And I tell them the truth, which is being able to do the show helps us get through the week. Because we're, we're feeling, I think I can say, the same way about things as probably <laughs> most of you are. But the fact that we get to stand up and make jokes and be funny and be up and be cheerful and everything that we're obligated to do helps us yeah, I don't know how I'd survive if I was just like you poor sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> just having to sit there and take it. Mm -hmm. My, uh, what I say is like we get to say on the radio the things that you all are just shouting at the radio. <laughs> That's pretty good. I have a question from the audience. This is a parent in the audience who says that their 10-year-old, who is here, loves Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, has been listening to it for two years, and on long car trips won't listen to anything else but Wait, Wait. And the question was, uh, are you aware of who's in your audience, how diverse it is? Do you do market research and try to figure out who's listening? Yeah, I mean, we get some of that stuff, but it doesn't, you know, the, it, it, it doesn't tell us that much. It's sort of a broad brush. But we are aware that kids like the show, and we had the same uh, result with Car Talk. And, you know, my, people would ask me why sometimes. My conclusion was that kids have an innate sense of when adults are misbehaving. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> And so kids loved hearing Tom and Ray, you know, doing what they weren't supposed to be doing on NPR because it didn't sound like anything else. And I think kids, you know, enjoy the same thing about Wait, Wait. I think they have a sense that these people are having a little too much fun. <laughs> and, Plus, and, we and do if, a lot of poop jokes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and if their parent were there, the parent would be shushing them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Peter, did, yeah. did do or did your daughters, your, your kids listen to uh, Wait, Wait? Uh, well, now they're all sort of teenager yeah. older, so they have no time for it. Yeah. Uh, but they, they, were, they, were, they were little. They kind of enjoyed that the, their father's voice would, uh, would come on the radio. Mm -hmm. But then they, 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 they used to come to the show and, and kind of in, and, and enjoy it mm -hmm. for the most part. I think so. so here's another audience question about who is your white whale guest? Somebody you've tried and tried and tried to get on the show but have been unsuccessful. <laughs> um, 
Well, George W. Bush, uh, we'd love to get uh, President Obama to come back on. He was on when he was a senator prior to being elected. Um, although, I'm going to brag, he left the stage. He was there with us in person. He left the stage, and as soon as he was gone, I looked at the audience and said, that guy's going to be president. Hmm? So it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I, li I like to think that he was, he yeah. just he'd heard me from off stage and said, wait yeah, a minute, that's a good idea. <laughs> Uh, there are some people we keep trying to get. Uh, we're all huge fans of Amy Poehler, and we've tried to get her for years, and she always turns us down very graciously. Mm -hmm. Every year we go to Tanglewood, and we try to get uh, James Taylor, who lives there, and he always turns us down not graciously. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Oh, I don't know. I, I've been thrilled with all the guests we have, and I, um, I, I'm not a big celebrity lover, I have to say. Um, I'm always um, much more fond of the guests who I don't expect anything from. Yeah, that's and then always they turn out to just be some like delightful in some way. I mean, I was just remembering a uh, Christina Lagarde. Oh, she was great. Yeah, I, but, I, we we all this. She was the head of the inter. She still is, I think, the head of the International Monetary Fund. And this happens sometimes. Very serious people end up on our show because their staff thinks it would be hilarious. <laughs> 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 And they have no idea who we are. Now, yeah, yeah, former yeah. staff. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so they get on the show, yeah, and, and I love it because here's Christine Lagarde, and she is French, and she is the head of the International Monetary Fund, and yeah. we're not going to talk about anything that she normally talks about. Yeah. Because we don't understand it. <laughs> and, and we're going to ask her about something else that we can understand, and so they get to talk about things they don't normally get to talk about. Mm -hmm. And they really like it. And so we ended up talking to Christine Lagarde about her career as a member of the French National Synchronized Swimming Team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and about the role of, that leg hair played. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns, out, it turns out, who knew this, it's Christine true. Lagarde, that synchronized swimmers do not shave their legs. And the reason is, is because if you think about it, they're upside down in the water, their legs are out of the water, and the only way they can tell how high their legs are, or whether they're like whether it, whether in the air rather than is by the water. feeling the air with their yeah. leg hairs. How about that? We learned, we learned that something. From the head of the we learned something tonight. So what was and it, this is NPR. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, she, she loved telling us that story. We loved hearing it. Everybody wins. Well, you you mentioned another a part of the show called Not My Job. Yes. Right, which is where that's, guests are quizzed. It's that's the same thing yeah, there too. Yeah. I jotted down a couple uh, of examples uh, when you had Madeleine Albright, the former U.S. Secretary of State, on, and you asked her about the, the history of Hugh Hefner and Playboy magazine. I can't remember why we did that. I don't know. Either. <laughs> and uh, author Salman Rushdie, who may have been under the fatwa at the time, I'm not sure, was asked about the history of Pez candy. <laughs> where did you come up with these? Just the dumbest <laughs> damn things. Yeah. We, we sit around, like, we just this did this. Is, this is what we get to do every day. Oh, wow. living. Like, we just did it's it today. Great. Today, we're yeah. gonna have, this week, we're going to have Gloria, Gloria Steinem on the show, which is exciting. <laughs> yeah. And so what are we going to talk to Gloria Steinem about? And so we, sometimes it's puns in their name. Sometimes it's like, well, they do this. Maybe they'll ask about that. But uh, here's a good example uh, from last week. We had this, it turns out, incredibly charming, fun scientist from the University of Utah named Nalini Nankarni, who is... She created the field of forest canopy biology. She's the first person to say, you know, I bet there's some interesting things up there. And she made her name and she created this field and she's very famous. And so we asked her about canopies. <laughs> and again, they, they kind of enjoy it because they don't normally get asked about that. So everybody wins. Yeah. I would say that uh, besides the two of you, perhaps the best known person on Wait Wait over the years has been Carl Castle. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Uh, uh, the the longtime um, announcer, what you call it? Uh, we, we, uh, you call official it? judge and scorekeeper, uh, presiding, judge presiding spirit. Yeah. yeah. So the audience question is, was Carl Castle involved from the beginning, and what was his biggest off-the-air contribution? Hmm. Well... Yeah, I mean, remember I, I, I sort of said that I had uh, You Bet Your Life in Mind, and so yeah. Carl was kind of my early icon for who I wanted to be the straight man, mm -hmm. and he was, he was involved very early on. Um, and I think, you know, what I, what I probably didn't realize when I cast him um, was that he ended up playing this very important role in the show without ever speaking it, which is that he, he brought gravitas to it. And he, he brought the sense that what we're actually talking about, what the show is based on, is real. Mm. It's actually news. And that makes it funnier, you know, mm -hmm. that we were then taking that and doing something with it. 
And he, without ever having to speak that, just through his presence, um, you know, conveyed to the audience that this, was, this stuff is anchored in reality. Yeah. And I, just, I was starting to yeah. tell Mark this earlier, yeah. but we just happened to be across the street from where I first met Carl Castle, mm -hmm. which was at a public radio convention in 1998. I had just been hired. They said, Peter, you're the host of the show, and next month you have to fly to San Francisco and tell everybody where they should listen. And I had never met Carl, because we'd only been doing the show via studio, studio to studio. He was in Washington. I was in New York. I never met him. And so it was in the lobby of that restaurant beyond the ferry building where they were having some sort of reception. And I walked up, and I remember this so vividly. There he was, and, and he was this southern gentleman, thinning gray hair, very he's tall, he's like 6'1", very distinguished looking. And that voice comes out of his face. And I remember he shakes my hand, and he says, Peter Sagal. Peter Sagal. <laughs> and he keeps shaking my hand. Peter <laughs> And I, it occurred to me later that he somehow knew that he, hearing him say your name was like so amazing <laughs> that he just wanted to give me that for a while. Uh, yeah, we, we all loved him. He, He's, he was a very, very nice man. The very nicest man. Decent man. What a voice. Yeah, a great what a guy. Voice, and, really. and he, and as here, nice as you would imagine he was. And here's the great thing about Carl, and I talk about this a lot when we talk about him, and because it's something I, I tried to learn from him. So Carl had this huge, lengthy career. He started at 16. He was in broadcasting. He ended up, after doing very many things at NPR doing the news in the 70s, and did that for 25 years until Doug gave him this second career being he did know. both for yeah he did both for a while but yeah. he <laughs> really his bets which is yeah smart <laughs> and so he he was he must have been in his 60s right he died like 20 years later in his early 80s so let's say he was in yeah. his early 60s and so he got this sort of thing and like all serious people he really wanted to be funny so he really enjoyed getting laughs and he would do anything we asked him to do to get a laugh he was great but he so much appreciated every day he got to do it. He never had a bad day. He never complained. He never like pulled a star things. I'm tired, I wanna go home, I don't wanna do this. So he was so grateful just to be able to do this. Uh, and it really was a lesson. And sometimes when I'm feeling a little full of myself and thinking, well, I deserve better than this or I'm tired of doing it, I just remember, what would Carl say? And mm -hmm. Carl would say just, you know, Carl would look at me and say, I, he, would, he would never be the kind of person who would ever lecture you, but he would certainly show you by example that should, you should be grateful that you have this amazing ability to talk to people and enjoy yourself doing it. So. He also had time for everybody. Mm -hmm. you know, people would line up after the shows uh, to, to speak to him. Paul is the same way. Yeah. You know, they, they both feel if, 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 if people are willing to listen to me or come out and see me, the least I can do is, you know, is like speak to them as long as they want to speak to me, which is also a really nice example for everybody. It's funny. I didn't think I'd, tonight we'd talk about things that Paula Poundstone and Carl Castle had in common. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Paula, well, we, we sign autographs, and I'm tired, and I always think of, like, I look at the line of people in front of me, and behind the last person is a martini. <laughs> <laughs> Get there. <laughs> Meanwhile, Paula has twice as many people, and she's spending twice as much time, if not more, with each of them. Mm -hmm. So I've been there for an hour. I've done it. I'm getting her up. I'm going to go to the bar and get my martini. Paula is still at it, and she'll be at it for another hour. Mm -hmm. And I said to her once, how do you do it? I'm just so tired. How do you get the energy after performing a whole show to have the energy to spend time with all those people you don't know? And she said to me, it's because I love them so much. Mm -hmm. And I thought she was joking. She wasn't. She mm -hmm. genuinely loves the audience and will spend all the time in the world with them if they want. All right, that's nice. Well, here's a serious audience question. It says, Peter, I love your socks. Where did you get them? Oh. <laughs> they were nice. Yeah, these those are on the radio, by the way. They are Argyle socks. Are these, are, these, are, these are actually official Syracuse University socks. Orange and blue. That I was yep. given when we went to upstate New York. I don't remember exactly where we were. And some people came and they said, here are some Syracuse University socks. And these are the socks that I use to indicate to myself and the world that it's time to do laundry. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know. Okay, so, so back in 2008, you guys were riding high. The show had won, won a Peabody that, that year. Also, the website was nominated for a Webby Award for humor. Good Lord, it was. And uh, <laughs> according, according to my research, NPR contracted with CBS Entertainment to create 
a television pilot for Wait Wait that included a host, Peter Sagal, and a Doug Berman as executive producer. I guess you weren't the benevolent overlord at that point. But that pilot was not picked up for regular production. Yeah. No. So I want to ask why not, and also ask if it's true that there's a rumor that, uh, that it's, 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 if it's true that NBC Universal is developing a television version of Wait Wait. Well, the reason is you can't win them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you can speak to this. I mean, my my general answer is, um, I you know I thought it was pretty good, and they thought it was pretty good. Um, and it didn't test well enough in Las Vegas, <laughs> which is where they go to test things. Um, in some senses, I came to think uh, that in, in the show on radio is somehow larger than life. You know, the people have this large presence, and they, um, when you put it on television, when you see everybody, it becomes life size, mm -hmm. and it's just not as not as good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that. The, what happened, as Doug says, is we, we, we filmed the show in, a, in front of a set, and then they sh CBS showed it to people at their testing facility, and everybody didn't like it. Uh, and I think there were a couple of problems. First of all, they had no idea who we are. Mm -hmm. They had no idea who Carl Castle was. So they had no like, loyalty built in. We, they, they didn't, I mean, everybody, one of the reasons that Carl was so important to the show is he had such a, a, an affection among the public radio audience that they were happy to follow them to this follow him to this show. If he was on it, it had to be good. That didn't work. But also, it's really messed up in terms of what people might expect. So for example, it's a game show. Who's playing the game? Are the panelists playing the game? Are the people who call in playing the game? And if it's a game show, why isn't there a real prize? <laughs> Where's my car? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and so, and you know, it, it didn't, wasn't our crowd. It wasn't our crowd, and, and will it work better this time with NBC? Oh, out? probably not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys both involved with it? With no, that? no. Uh, this time we, we got <laughs> smart. Uh, I'm not we said it. you take care of it. You figure it out. Yeah, that's right. So we'll now, see if they do anything with it. Now, Peter, when your benevolent overlord lets you go on vacation, yes, there has to be a substitute host, and you've had a number of them over the years. We have. Do you have a favorite or two of them? Uh, well, Tom Hanks didn't suck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, that was weird. <laughs> why, was it, why was it weird? Well, have you ever had the, a kind of dream, it's a certain genre of dream, uh, where there's like a, a celebrity shows up in your dream, in your life, and you don't know the celebrity and it's really weird. And the second thing, part of, this is a common kind of dream, is when you have been somehow removed from your life and somebody else is doing what you do, like, usually it's in the context of like, oh, you know, my wife had a d different husband. I wasn't there anymore. It was weird. I'm not sure everyone else had that dream, but you No, no. I, I, so I, I'm like, I'm like listening And to it wasn't a dream, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I refer to my earlier remarks. Um, uh, so it was really weird to hear Tom Hanks do my job. Mm -hmm. It was very strange. He was uh, great. He was great. He was. He, he really loves the show and he, really wanted to do a good job. And he it. came to play. I mean, yeah. he, you know, you would think someone like that might show up, you know, Thursday afternoon and you know, <laughs> put a couple hours in and walk out. He, he he was there all week with us. He was working on the material. He was, you know, he really liked it and uh, did a, did a great job. Do you have another favorite host? Substitute. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I like. I thought Jesse Klein did a great yeah, job for us great. when she did it. I think Peter Gross has been great. I mean, there are others. Uh, Mike Pesca's done a nice job. You know, um, it's not an easy job. I mean, it's it's you know, you know, everybody is 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 pinch hitting for Lou Gehrig. You know, mm -hmm. um, so it's. it's <laughs> I had to think about that and decide if it was a compliment, and it is. So <laughs> proceed. No. Thank you. Um, you know, whatever we do is going to be different, mm -hmm. you know. Um, hopefully it'll be different in a good way, but it's never going to be what people, you know, have come to love and it sort of count on every week. So we know we know that's happening when we have a, a guest host, and we that's why we chain Peter to the desk most of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and rarely let him away. And, and Peter, you, you said earlier that you don't feel like you're, that, that wait, wait, it's kind of part of a national conversation exactly, but... But to what degree are you? I mean, if you've got six million listeners, people it's it's are weird. Um, I think we're not on the same culture, level of cultural relevance as the guys on TV, and that's just because TV in America is privileged. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody watches TV. 
the, I mean, if you're in TV, you're famous, even if people don't watch your show. Like, for example, I have never seen an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, not a minute of one. Mm. But I know exactly who Kim Kardashian is. Mm -hmm. And that's just not true in radio. Um, and I also think it's, it's particularly not true in public radio. There are the people who like public radio, and there are people who've never heard of it and don't listen. Mm -hmm. There's nobody who knows about public radio but doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. Because why would they be spending their time? Although I have to say, our, I, mean, I, I think this is true, that our listenership numbers are actually higher than a lot of that stuff. Which is weird. I mean, yeah. because... A pure number of people who listen. Yeah. During, the, during the heyday of Jon Stewart, when he was in The Daily Show, we were told once that more people listened to our show than watched Stewart and Colbert combined. Wow. Which is weird. And it just goes to show that there's this multiplying effect in TV. Um, so we're never going to be the... The, the, the stopover for, say, all the Democratic candidates, for example, yeah. have to go through Colbert. And we're never going to be that. And also it's because we're not as, we don't spend as much time in that kind of substance. We do a lot more weird, goofy news stories. But that's okay. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I guess the, the flip side, the positive side of that is, is that there's a certain burnout that happens on TV. You know, your celebrity kind of flashes by and then everybody gets sick of you. You know, and here we are 20 years later and Car Talk went on for 25 years. And, yeah. You know, there's a, it's a nice companionable thing that happens, you know, every week. And, and it's like visiting with a, with a friend you like or a guest you like. Yeah. Now, Doug, since you've had these two hits on public radio, a, 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 a medium that doesn't have lots and lots of, of well-known hits, I know you've told me many people have come to you with other ideas, some of them good, some of them not so good. What are most some of the most, most, most of them not so most good. Most of them not so good. What are some of the most creative ideas people have approached you with? Well, there was the car talk of cosmetics. I didn't really go for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the nature of, you know, yeah. everybody wants to do a car talk of, you know, and it's a subject that they are particularly, what they, they're particularly expert in mm -hmm. and think they're very funny in. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, neither is true. Um, and then, you know, the weight, weight of something or other, you know, yeah. they want to focus on something. So, you know, and then, and then, you know, there are a bunch of off the wall ideas that people just want, want done. And, and I'm, I, I mean, I, I stole this uh, um, phrase from a professor of mine at Wesleyan um, named Alvin Lucier, who once ran, I ran, ran into him, and I said, how you doing? He said, well, I'm in my declining years. He said, people ask me to do stuff now, and I decline. <laughs> <laughs> good. Anybody ever, anybody ever approach you with an idea you thought, hey, that's actually pretty good? Yeah. No, I, I, I encourage people who have good ideas. I just don't want to do the work. Yeah, you know, I'm happy to I'm happy to talk to them about it. <laughs> he, he, you talked about how much you enjoy the show. Do you ever, do you ever get tired of it? Do you ever feel like we go? Oh man, I wish I didn't have to do it. This I, I, I've, as poor Doug knows, I've gone through times where I've been like, oh man, we're doing it again. Mm -hmm. um, but recently, not so much. Mm -hmm. Recently, I've been very engaged, and the reason is because people constantly let us know how much they rely on us. Mm -hmm. And I really have come around to believe that all of us, and myself in particular, because I'm sort of the ringleader, we're doing a public service. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people say, you know, the joke about our current troubles is people will sometimes ask you, what did you do during the war, Daddy? Uh, or Grandpa, or whatever the cliche is. Um, did you just tweet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I do tweet a lot, but <laughs> I, I will be able to say, if I am ever asked that question, well, I did this goofy radio show every week that I am told help people get through the week. Yeah, which is very powerful. And, and that, you know, it's... It, uh, it, it's when I was a young, much younger man, when Doug met me, um, I was a playwright, and I had ambitions of being influential, of speaking truth to power. And it took me a while to disabuse of myself of that notion that I could do the same thing through this radio show. For one thing, power doesn't listen. <laughs> uh, but I came to, and it was that 9-11 show, I think that had a lot to do with it, I came to understand that my job is not to speak truth to power. My, no, my job is not to be influential or to affect the conversation or the dialogue or whatever. My job is to make people happy for an hour. And if you can do that, then you're doing a tremendous amount of good in this world. Yeah, there's a... When you really make people laugh, it's, it's an involuntary reaction, mm -hmm. you know? 
and it's a very cathartic thing. It's like very, it's physical as well as mental, you know. And when you, when, when we're able to do that for an hour every week, I think we're really improving people's lives in a way, you know. Um, so it's it's nice to remember that. And I, you know, I, I I have days like Peter, you know, when anything you do that's a job, there are some days you're just not going to feel like doing it. But I have to say, you know, that we have meetings every day with this group of people. Um, and I wish we had time could mention their names because they're really great. Mike Danforth, Ian Chillog, yeah. Jennifer Mills, Thank Miles Durmboss, Lillian King, mm -hmm. Lorna White, Robert Newhouse, Colin Miller, uh, 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 oh my God, Gina Cappadona, and I know I'm forgetting somebody. Who he, that's, that's he, he does it every week at the right. scripts. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, the, the meeting where we, where we sort of talk about the news and we try to figure out what's funny and we try to make things funny, we try to make each other laugh, that's the best hour of the day, you know? It really is. I'd say, you know, more weeks than not. Really. I, I know we're out of time, but can I tell one story about sure, this? This, this, is, this is a yeah. story about the good that maybe we do in this world. We were going down to Charleston, I believe it was, um, South Carolina. And before we went, we got a letter from a woman who lived there. And she told us this story. And the story was that her partner, a woman, had gotten very, very ill. I don't remember what it was and she had ended up in a coma, hanging on to life by a thread. And the doctors told the woman who was writing to us, that woman, they said, look, your partner's in this deep coma. We've done everything we can for her. The decision about whether she's gonna wake up or not is really up to her. She's gonna decide whether she wants to come back to life or continue over to the other side. So if you wanna help her make a decision to come back, give her some reason to do it. Bring her something she likes in this life. And so the letter writer told us, she brought in whatever the technology was at that moment, a Bluetooth speaker or a boombox, and played repeated episodes of her favorite radio show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And she woke up. <laughs> and we read this and we were like, oh my God, what an amazing story about the value that we bring to other people's lives. This is great. Well, we're coming to Charleston. Here, please, have tickets. Come backstage. And she came backstage and there she was and there her partner was and she's totally healthy. And we hugged them and we took pictures with them. We were so happy. And it occurs to me, it occurred to me right then that it, that either was like the greatest validation of the work that you do in this world and its effect on another human being or the most elaborate and brilliant scam to get two free tickets to a <laughs> And, and I gotta say, I'm okay with either. Yeah, <laughs> we, had a, we had a similar experience, similar experiences with Car Talk. This woman yeah. wrote to us, and her, I think it was her husband, um, had been declining into Alzheimer's, um, and you know, over the years he sort of drifted further and further away, and they had less and less, you know, real communication. And they were driving in the car one day, and she really lost him for the most part. Um, and Car Talk was on the radio, and the guy said something, started laughing, and all of a sudden, he started laughing, and he looked at her, and she looked at him, and they had this laugh together that they hadn't had, you know, in years, and she said, and at that moment, I plowed into the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> but, she said, it was worth it, and thank you. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, we really have just time for just one more question. So I've got a quickie that you can both answer uh, separately. Very simple. What was your favorite Wait Wait episode ever? That's a. That's that, not. You know, a, we're all going to go back and listen to can it. Can you ask us another one? That's, really <laughs> that's the one I got. Yeah, I don't know. A I don't favorite? Know the I, don't, I don't. I mean, I, there are certain moments uh, that yeah. that we all love, but it's but, but it's hard just like say one particular show. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously, the Not My Job guests have been very impressive. When Senator Obama came, that was pretty cool. I remember when the, um, when the uh, Scooter Libby case was completed, um, and then he was commuted, the sentence was commuted by the president, George W. Bush. Uh, Patrick Fitzgerald, the prosecutor who had prosecuted the Scooter Libby case, the only interview he did was with us. <laughs> and I asked him, I said, Everybody wants to interview you. Why are you interviewing with us? And he said, well, because I can answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and we, there, there, there are all those moments that you love with like Paula going off on some study or some elaborate riff that somebody else goes on or some story that Roy Blunt tells. We all love those too. Mm -hmm. um, but like a, 
a single episode? It's it's hard to say. Yeah, I don't think I don't think I could ever. How about a moment? Uh, yeah. I'll give you a moment that that wasn't on the air mm -hmm. um, that that I remember very well. That I'm sure Peter remembers. We were in Berkeley, California, at the um, Zellerbach at Zellerbach, and uh, they had a, uh, uh, a, a, a a interpreter for uh, for deaf people, <laughs> and. Um, and that, so everything that was said on the stage, this woman would do repeat in sign language for people who, who couldn't hear it. And at some point, um, I think it was Sue Ellicott and Adam Felber. Sue Ellicott, Adam and, Felber, and Paula. Yeah, and Paula were there. And, and they noticed this happening. And of course, with their minds, they decide, let's have some fun. And they say, you know, this woman has to say everything we say. And the woman then repeats, this woman has to say everything we say. The, the context and was, we were doing a show, we, we did this at the time, we were doing a show about history. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the real news story was about Ronald Reagan getting some law through Congress. Budget, he, yeah. Budget or something. Yeah. And he, his quote was, God, I feel like I just crapped a pineapple. Yeah. <laughs> and I had said it twice when Sue Ellicott said, you know, every time you say crap a pineapple, she has to she sign. She has to <laughs> grab this. <laughs> to which, yeah. to which, to which Paula Poundstone said, oh, so you mean that if I were to say, as Peter just did, that like I'm talking about crapping a pineapple, she has to sign the words crap a pineapple. And Adam Fumper said, well, what if you were to say to crap a wriggling ferret? And so it went on. And I this, want to see how far they can. And they just and it went on this woman. and it went on for yeah. a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we, we didn't we didn't broadcast. We couldn't broadcast at the time because this was 1999 or so, and it was just inappropriate for that time. And of course, since then we've had HBO and Netflix, and we finally decided let's air it. What the hell? <laughs> and and so we did. We put it on a fundraiser. This is actually show. I don't know if you remember this, yeah. but we. We decided, okay, we're going to broadcast it. Did this. we decide not to ask? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of Doug Berman's rules for life is don't ask permission, ask for forgiveness. <laughs> um, and uh, so we did that. And as I remember, and one of the very, very few times NPR has ever like called us on the carpet, they said, okay, do you understand? Because this was right after the whole thing with the... The, the Super Bowl thing with Justin Timberlake and whatever and, oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and so the FCC was like all of a sudden like well we have, can't have any obscenity and somebody from NPR told us do you realize that you get fined by the FCC for every single instance of a profanity and in that segment you say the word crap or crapping 45 times <laughs> so, so that's I didn't like, know there was a 44 crap limit <laughs> <laughs> so they said like that is like we could be fined like half a million dollars, so we've yeah. never been able to broadcast it again. Wow, well, we can't top that. So I'm going to say, let's thank our host, Peter Sagal and Doug Berman of NPR. <laughs> Mr. We also thank everyone here in San Francisco, as well as our audience on radio, television, and the internet. I'm Mark Zitter, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you for saving this.